It is very reasonable for your examiner to ask you about the mechanism of action of various anticoagulants used for thromboprophylaxis in the FRCS exam. And uh, for me to understand uh, the mechanism of action or where they work, uh, I, I map out the coagulation cascade. Now, many of your examiners won't know the coagulation cascade and it, and it can look quite impressive if you can draw it out quite quickly and then mark on the various um, areas of the cascade where these anticoagulations can work. So first of all, the coagulation cascade is uh, broadly divided into your intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. Now the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways, um, sorry, Mr. that Esther, they, they all come together to, towards your common pathway and I'll explain where that is later. So first of all, to start off with your intrinsic pathway, you start off with factor 12, uh, which is inactive. It then gets converted into its active form, uh, which is denoted by a little a, uh, factor 12a. Factor 12a promotes the conversion of factor 11 to factor 11a. And then this in itself uh, promotes the conversion of factor 9 to factor 9a. Then this promotes the conversion of factor 10 to factor 10a. And factor 10a promotes the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Uh, prothrombin is also known as factor 2 and thrombin known as factor 2a. Um, thrombin uh, in turn promotes the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And uh, fibrinogen is also known as factor 1 and fibrin is 1a. Now fibrin is essentially your fibrin clot and um, if, uh, if, if, if left alone you have uh, endogenous products which would eventually degrade your fibrin into your fibrin degradation products. And, um, and you need plasmin for this. So plasmin breaks fibrin down into uh, your fibrin degradation products and in turn plasmin comes from plasminogen. Now, coming up to your extrinsic pathway, um, if you have uh, damaged tissues, uh, you get a release of tissue factor. So this is from mechanical damage to tissues. And your tissue factor itself promotes the conversion of factor 10 to factor 10a and therefore, from the intrinsic pathway down here, it continues into the common pathway. So the common pathway starts from factor 10 onwards. In addition to your tissue factor from your damaged tissues, you have factor 7a, which comes from factor 7 in your extrinsic pathway. In addition, from factor 9 to factor 10a, factor 8a here uh, also uh, helps promote, along with factor 9a, promotes the conversion of 10 to 10a. And of course, this comes from factor 8 here. And then from factor 10a, which promotes prothrombin to thrombin, is also aided by 
factor 5a, which comes from factor 5. Now, there's, a, there's, a, there's also a positive feedback loop in the coagulation cascade. When it all kicks off, uh, this is your intrinsic, this is your extrinsic. When you get down to your thrombin, thrombin itself has a positive feedback loop which works really at three places. It positively feeds back to promote the conversion of factor 11 to 11a here. It also promotes the conversion of factor 8 to factor 8a. And uh, finally, it promotes the conversion of factor 5 to factor 5a. Now this positive feedback loop, as you can see, kind of uh, uh, propagates and, uh, and amplifies the, the cascade to the final product, which is your fibrin clot. Now, from here, you can start talking about where particular anticoagulations work, anticoagulants work. And the ones you need to know about are heparin, low molecular weight heparin, uh, possibly dibigatran, uh, and also tranexamic acid um, and, uh, and, and, and warfarin, finally, as well. So, before, uh, so, so let's go to the heparins. Um, so heparin is actually a, um, it, it actually potentiates the action of antithrombin-3. And antithrombin-3 um, is... Uh, endogenous and as the name suggests its normal role is to inhibit uh, factor 10 and thrombin so that's that's its usual role heparin promotes or initiates antithrombin 3 and by doing so it in turn uh, inactivates thrombin and factor 10a, or inhibits uh, those, two, those two factors. Low molecular weight heparin is a direct inhibitor of factor 10a and works here. Uh, another direct in inhibitor, which is actually commonly used as well, of factor 10a is rivaroxaban. So that, that works here as well. Dibigatran is a, um, is a direct inhibitor of thrombin as, as well. So uh, dibigatran, which uh, is also um, licensed by uh, the Department of Health, acts here. And, um, and tran tranexamic acid, um, which is used in major trauma. You should probably know a bit about the multi-center CRASH-2 trial, um, is an anti-fibrinolytic. So uh, fibrinolysis occurs by plasmin, which is from plasminogen. And tranexamic acid inhibits the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin, so you do not get your fibrin degradation product, so you do not get fibrinolysis. So you, you, you have more integrity to your fibrin clot. So tranexamic acid works here by inhibiting the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. Uh, conversely, uh, the, the, the medics uh, thrombolize um, uh, people for massive peas, uh, and, and strokes, and they uh, often use uh, TPA or streptokinase. And uh, incidentally, that actually potentiates the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. And that's how your th uh, thrombolysis agents work. They work here. So uh, beyond that, you now need to know how warfarin works. Now, warfarin, uh, we know, 
is an inhibitor of vitamin K, but more specifically, it actually inhibits uh, vitamin K reductase. Now, vitamin uh, K reductase is, uh, is an enzyme and it's essential for the reduction of vitamin K to reduced vitamin K. Okay, so, so that actually helps. Vitamin K reductase helps this process of converting vitamin K to reduce vitamin K. Reduced vitamin K is a cofactor which is required for the gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid. Now, glutamic acid, so glutamic acid for carboxylation requires oxygen and carbon dioxide. And this gamma carboxylation creates gamma carboxy glutamic acid. And this is essential for clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So, so this, this process of vitamin K being reduced by vitamin K reductase, reduced vitamin K is an essential cofactor for the gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid to gamma carboxyglutamic acid, which is essential for the components of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Once reduced vitamin K is used in this process, it gets oxidized to oxidized vitamin K. And again, oxidized vitamin K is converted to vitamin K by vitamin K reductase here. So Warfarin itself is a direct inhibitor of this enzyme, vitamin K reductase, which in turn is essential through the gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid, is essential for the components of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So on the coagulation cascade, you can see that warfarin acts here in the uh, extrinsic pathway, also acts here at the beginning of the common pathway and also acts here at factor nine in the intrinsic uh, pathway and uh, finally at prothrombin as well, which is factor two. So acts here, warfarin acts here as well. So when patients, uh, particularly necophema patients, when they uh, come in with uh, uh, long-term warfarin and their INR is 3.5 and you rapidly want to get it down, um, we often give vitamin K to try to reverse the process of warfarin. Um, however, as we know, this can take quite a long time for the INR to finally come down. And we uh, commonly ask um, the hematologists uh, on, on a quicker reversal agent and they often suggest Octoplex. Now, Octoplex is a prothrombin uh, complex concentrate and essentially what it is, it's a, it's a really expensive uh, product which contains clotting factors. And specifically, it contains clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So it makes sense that Octoplex containing these factors uh, directly reverses the effects of warfarin by providing the factors that, that vitamin K is essential uh, to, to make in the first place. So this is the uh, clotting cascade and how it can be applied uh, and, and, and how uh, various anticoagulants uh, work, uh, which are commonly used in orthopaedic surgery.